in my world around diversity and equity and underrepresented communities and, and changing things is that we sort of get in this mindset that it has to happen. And if it doesn't happen right now, then we failed and, and the world has failed and the system has failed. And it's really exhausting. Um, and what I tell everyone is we've got a lifetime's worth of work to do and it's all good work and it's work that changes people's lives. It's work that keeps people alive, who gives them the opportunity to have a family, a home, a career, a car, whatever it is that they need for them to have that. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Eternal Optimist Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Drinkon. And today, we have a special treat. Today, we have international keynote speaker and executive director for Disability Solutions and a referral from Mr. Jason Putnam, one of our favorite guests of all time, someone who uh, is already inspiring uh, it inspired me in the start of our conversation. She is the hostess of Changing Minds, Changing Lives mm -hmm. podcast, and she's got a great sense of humor and she's super cool already. Uh, please give a warm welcome to our guest, Miss Julie Sowash. Julie, how are you today? I am wonderful, Matt. Thank you for having me on. And um, I will say I'm most honored that uh, Jason Putnam thought of me to, to join the show because as you know, he's kind of the best. So uh, yeah, it's happy to meet you and, and happy to be here. Yes. Well, why do you say Jason Putnam is the best? Because I'm sure he's going to listen to this. What? Why is he the best? <laughs> he better. Because um, he just he just brings warmth and energy and amazing like people around him. I mean, he's excellent at his job, but that's like the least of, of all of the energy that Jason just brings to a room every time he's in it. Yeah. He always makes you feel happy and welcome and like yeah. whatever's going on outside of whatever you're doing right then really doesn't matter. Totally right. Yeah. I remember we had him on the show. I totally enjoyed, he had Star Wars in the background. We talked about rock <laughs> bands and uh, super cool. And so, yeah, it's, it's great to have you here. Uh, highly recommended, Julie. And let's dive right on in. Uh, to give okay. our listeners a little bit of context, we started, I said, international keynote speaker. And to me, that just sounds freaking amazing. When did you become international keynote speaker, <laughs> Julie? Um, I think it was 2019 when I first started speaking um, outside of the US. Wow. Um, and and it, I will tell you, my marketing director said I had to put it on my profile because I feel really silly um, being all like, look at me. But yes, I, I do get the chance to speak around the world and in America and to audiences all around um, the, the world who want to learn how to do what we do a little bit better. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for, for humbly sharing that. And yeah, Julie, Julie's a dose of humility and just super cool <laughs> about this because she is a very well-known international speaker. And I, I've done a little bit digging in the background and we'll get to her websites and her social media in a little while. Uh, but we're, we're glad to have you, Julie. Let's, let's dive into the hard question. We like to start with every guest and, and feel free to start with something that's challenging right now in your life or go back to, to birth, just anywhere from now going backwards. Uh, we'd love to set the stage by asking what's something that's been incredibly challenging for you in your life that you had to endure and, and overcome? Yeah, so I would say um, what brought me here today, what brought me to this place um, with you and knowing Jason and being able to do the work that I do um, really is part of the hardest part of my life. So I um, have lived with disabilities, hidden disabilities since I was probably 18, 19. Um, they really started to become exacerbated um, and really set in even more after I became a, a young parent. Um, and it, what I struggled with is that I grew up in the Midwest, um, grew up in a very religious, very Jesus oriented house um, where we didn't really talk about what was wrong with us. We didn't really talk about what was happening in our head and in our heart. Um, and when we did, that was really the, the pushback was, well, have you sinned today? Or why haven't you asked Jesus to really do this for you? Why don't you trust him enough to lay all of your worries and your cares upon him? And, and religion is a fantastic thing, but it doesn't fix 
a mind that works differently. Okay. And so, you know, really coming into being a, a young professional, a young then single parent, um, I was struggling very, very deeply with not just depression, anxiety, but constant, constant panic attacks that were um, by the end um, every single day, lasting sometimes more than an hour a day. Um, and Julie, for some context, I, I appreciate what you're sharing. You know, it's making me, uh, it, I, that's definitely some emotion is coming out, just feeling and hearing the story. For those who don't know, when you say a panic attack or an anxiety for an hour a day, I, I'd like to ask, what, what does that look like or what does that mean? Because I'm, can you help understand what is that? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard to explain. It's just this fear that for me, anyway, I'll just give you my experience yeah. of complete and total, utter, uncontrollable fear that I'm going to die, that I can't breathe, that I'm too hot, that something is wrong. Um, and it's something that I had to deal with by myself for a really long time. Be and, and I didn't even know that I just thought it was like the way that I was made. And so like, for example, when I worked in an office and I'm now really lucky enough to, to have a company that I work for that's remote, um, I would hide in the bathroom. The bathroom at work was my safe space. And so I was always, you know, run, hide in the bathroom, try to get it back together as much as I could, go back out, make sure my boss saw me doing work, doing all the things I need to do, and then run back and go as soon as it became so overwhelming again that I had to get to a place where I felt safe. Why was the bathroom the safe place? No clue. Huh. Um, I, I think it was really just uh, probably more concerned about being embarrassed. And then it became habitual yeah. um, that that became the place that I went to. It still is when I have a panic attack, to be honest, they happen very infrequently now. I'm very blessed to say that. But so that was just the constant. And, yeah. and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an A player. I, you know, have, I, I co-founded a business. I've co-founded multiple businesses. I, I run organizations, you know, I do all of these things. And so it wasn't like one of those, I think a lot of times when people think about people with anxiety or depression or just disabilities in general is like, you're just always looking for a way to get out of work. And that's not how we function. That's not how most people function. I wanted to grow my career and do all of this amazing work. And what ended up happening is that I would take my work home and that work then would get done all night. And then I was missing time with my kids and I was checked out during time that I needed to be parenting. So it was just like this constant spiral of guilt and shame and not doing enough, which just builds up all of that anxiety and that terror um, to a point where, you know, and, and it, this is not something I, I share a lot, but I feel comfortable talking, talking here to your audiences that for probably a good five years, I thought about suicide every single day. I would put my kids on the bus. I would get in my car, in my garage, I would start it. And I would just have that moment of like, it's so quiet. My brain can be quiet. I can have some peace. I just want this to stop. And fortunately, I had little people who loved me and needed me and were everything in my life. So I, I didn't take that route. Um, but, it, but it was an everyday struggle for a long time. And so I'll, I guess I can pause for a minute because I can just keep talking. But that, that was really kind of the low point in my life. Um, for sure. And, and really what got me out of that got me to this place. Whew. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing so deeply and, and very real. Wow. Man. So five years, it was a, it was a constant daily challenge and a struggle. And now that we're all on your side and we're, we're feeling like I'm, I literally have had a couple of tears as you're sharing the story. So thank you now things have somehow started to shift or evolve or change? And can you help us to see how did you start to work your way out of that? Was it all at once or was it gradual or just how did that show up for you? Yeah, it, It's never all at once, right? Life is, is a journey. We're always 
um, working to be a little bit better than we were yesterday. Um, but I will say I never thought I could be as healthy as I am now. Um, for sure. I didn't even think that that was in my wheelhouse. Um, never. Um, so when I graduated from university, I took a job at the state of Indiana and I was managing a federal grant called the Medicaid Infrastructure Grant. And the long story short of that is it's a federal grant that helps states to identify and overcome uh, barriers to employment for people with disabilities, um, which is all a really long way to say, how do we get people to work when they have disabilities in a meaningful way? Yes. And I was lucky enough to work with a group of women, um, including a leader who even without me telling them, knew that what I was living was not stability. And even though everything was getting done, I was getting the promotions, I was getting, you know, bigger grant awards, all of those things. They cared enough to say, we don't know what's going on, but this isn't what stable looks like. And I had never in my life had someone say, that what you're going through isn't what you have to go through and not just a flaw or a defect of your, your personality or, or the way that your brain functions. And so they said, you know, you need to go talk to a doctor. You need to, to find something that is, is someone who's going to help figure out how to get you to stable. And so, you know, I went to my doctor a few more times and I, I said, look, I just can't think, I can't process. Everything is constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop. And what finally happened was I got diagnosed with ADHD. Okay. And I was about 30 when that happened. And all of a sudden, I was sleeping at night. I My blood pressure went down 20 points. The anxiety attacks all but stopped. And I was able to be in a place where I could start cognitive therapy to deal with other things I needed to deal with um, because I could at least get the physical symptoms of my disabilities under control and, and stable. And so then I got to enjoy my children and be present with my children and start looking at building the business that I have, you know, that we have now and, and how, um, really just two women who it's not like I was super close to. It was not like, you know, we were BFFs or hang out for drinks or anything, but could recognize and saw the value in me in a human as a human that said, we're just going to let you know that, that there's better out there for you. Um, there's better than, than what you're living. And that's not because you're broken. It's because you need help to manage these things that are just the way that your body and your brain are built. Mm. So many things I want to dive into. I just want to say I have a, a tremendous degree of respect for people that are successfully serving others while struggling themselves with something. And you have done that, done it for a long time, undiagnosed and really challenged. And then after the ADD diagnosis, you found a way to manage things better or, or more effectively or just have a better balance. And yeah. you did it with others. You allowed yourself to receive some, some feedback or support from others. So, so many good things have happened because you just kept trying and you kept trying to figure it out and just massive respect uh, for you. everything you've shared. So can you, uh, can you share a little bit more about being the executive director of Disability Solutions and kind of that mission and, and bring that to the yeah. podium, please? Love to hear more. Yeah, so um, again, getting stable opened other, opened other doors. Okay. And I had the opportunity about 15 years ago now um, to just write a, a grant for this little nonprofit, not little, but a, a nonprofit in Connecticut um, for a program called Roses for Autism. And that program was helping youth um, with autism to run e-commerce, to grow roses in this amazing rose farm, um, to learn all the agricultural pieces, but plus like the marketing, sales, and e-commerce and customer service piece. 
So I did that. thought, hey, this is really cool. Um, no big deal. In and out, little extra cash in my pocket. And um, a, about a year and a half after that, I got a call from the CEO of that organization. And they said, hey, uh, PepsiCo has been on our board of directors for the past, let's say, 20 years. And they say, you know, we, they came to us and said, we really are getting pretty good at hiring, you know, people of color. We're getting better at hiring women. We're getting better at hiring veterans. We can't figure out how to hire people with disabilities. If we pay you, will you build that for us? And uh, and Tom, the, the CEO at the time, called me and said, hey, will you come build this for us? And <laughs> you, like, oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't say no to to one of the biggest brands in the world building something for your community yeah. and willing to put in the time and the space and the money to figure out how to do it correctly. It, it, and especially back then, it was just unheard of for people, for companies to spend on our community in a real talent based way and not like a, um, a charity based way. And so yeah. really then that's where, that's where the, the work started. And it was actually July of, of 2012 uh, when I sat down with a uh, still friend and still champion of, of, what came to be Pepsi Act, um, and we started look, looking at what does the business case look like for this? How do we um, get Pepsi's already bought in? But how do we keep them bought in? How do we show them that this is something that's worth investing in year over year? And I was so incredibly lucky to work with a company that trusted us, that trusted me with data, with access to systems that that didn't try to hide the things they weren't doing well yet and let us cut our teeth on one of the biggest brands in the world and figure out this is how you hire people with disabilities. This is how you do it at scale. And this is how we tell the CEO, the CFO and the COO, this is, this is a good thing to do. Mm. And for the first about five or six years, uh, Pepsi was our only client. And, and we just continued to grow and refine um, this model. And then we said, you know what, if, if this is worth Pepsi's time and worth Pepsi's money, um, okay. other companies will buy it too. Okay. And what we will have is something that is both mission driven because it gets people to work and it changes the, I hate the word paradigm, but it's the one I'm going to use. It changes the paradigm for corporate leaders about our value in the workplace. Okay. I follow. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Loving it so far. I, as a business person, I'm loving that you're getting to cut your teeth with one of the biggest brands in the world and you're really good at what you do coming in and you're building something for them that's going to last. Awesome. And then as a, as yes. a business coach, the other part of me is like, okay, so all the eggs are in this basket with PepsiCo for like five or six years. And then you bring on other outside clientele. So now you got the the semblance of now we're, we're scaling the business with big brand and now scaling it over here. So, so many places I'm excited to hear. So please continue more. Where, where, what's the next next place in the saga yes. here? <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I mean, it was, it was really a lot of, of learning um, and learning together and being, again, having a partner in Pepsi that was willing to go on the road and tell the story together because they were so proud of the work. Yes. And the first, the first couple of years, actually, this I, this is one of my favorite stories. So the first two years, um, Pepsi funded the work, but we also had a couple of um, charitable organizations come in and also supplement so we could build the team and do all those things. And at the end of that two-year cycle, they said, hey, we would still really love to fund this work with Pepsi and we would be willing to give you some more money. And we sat down as a team, we sat down with our CEO and we said, no, thank you. Um, because we had to put our money where our mouth was. We have to say, this is a viable business that has to be able to stand alone. And we have to have enough faith in our community and the value that we bring as employees that it's worth buying. And that was... You know, that was one of those business decisions that I learned from Tom, our, our CEO at the time, about being bold, about yeah. just saying, no, this is this is our baby. We've built it. It's not a it's not a public model. It's our model. 
and we're going to build it into a successful business because we believe in this team, but we also believe in in the value of our community. And and someone has to stop saying, please hire Joe because he has a disability and you feel sorry for him. Now we need someone to say, hire Joe because he's great. Yes. He can get the job done. Whatever that job that Joe fits in, that's the one to go to. Um, and so, you know, that's really what we did. And it was hard. <laughs> Selling stuff is not easy. Yeah. It isn't. And it's not my forte still to this day. What was it like the first uh, time you talk- went to give a sales pitch? Uh, um, <laughs> I, I have blocked that from my memory. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're still here today, team. So we know that uh, it taught us something, but okay. So not a, not yes, a sales yes. person per se. Not a sales, still not. Uh, evangelist, yes, but not a salesperson. Great lens, and, love it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I I fortunately am good at recognizing, recognizing what I'm not good at. Um, and knowing when I need to ask for help and sales is one of those things. And that was really the big game changer for us too, is, is we recognized that we were acting like a nonprofit and we had to stop acting like a nonprofit. And we started to have to act like a business that had a sales team and marketing and doing all of those things. And yeah, we had to do it on a shoestring budget, but that was the priority. Um, and so, you know, we hired a sales director and we started doing sales classes and, you know, it, it just, that was it. And all of a sudden we were, you know, one year we were at $185,000 in sales and the next year we were at a million and the next year we were at more and more. And it's grown every year for the past five years um, because we made good decisions and, right. and we made um, honest decisions about where our strengths were and where opportunities were. And that dramatically changed how we started thinking about our business. And, and we also had to think about our, how, we, how we help people to understand. There's for a long time, how I spoke to disability, how I spoke to um, you know, the product, it was too complicated. And I think it was because I wasn't completely sold on myself yet. And I wasn't completely, so I felt like, oh, if I say all of these words, then you'll think, oh, this seems complicated. I need this lady to come in and do it for me with her team. Mm -hmm. Um, And what I was doing was just scaring the holy hell out of everyone. And (laughs) yes, yes, dramatically. I have scared Um, the holy hell out of people too. I'm with you. (laughs) Yes. And, and being that you are, you know, you have the sales background, my husband could productize anything. And he was like, dear Jesus, Julie, keep it simple. And so we really started working on a product. I think I like this set. guy already, this man you call husband, because I think those words have come out of my amazing. mouth too. Keep it simple, Julie, because I'm married to a Julie. Yes. Our audience knows that. but. <laughs> <laughs> And so he, you know, taught me like, keep it simple. And we started really thinking about um, what are solutions that we can put in packages that we can take to business leaders that they understand that they're already comfortable with that fit within the, the systems and the technologies that they're already using. And we're meeting them where they are, right? We're not asking, not everyone is a Pepsi, not everyone is a Frito. Um, We can't ask everyone to, to, take the world on. But what we can do is ask them to do these things that they're comfortable with. And as their journey matures, then they can do more things. Mm -hmm. And because of the way that we, the commitment that we made to each other as a team a long time ago is that we don't do things that don't have outcomes, right? So if I can't prove it, I don't want to do it. And so we know that we have more than 8,000 people that are working. We know that we've trained I think uh, close to 12,000, maybe more than 12,000 people leaders. We know we have almost 20,000 community-based organizations that we work with around the world. Like it had to be demonstrable. Yes. And so once we figured that out, productize, keep it simple, meet them where they are and show them something that they can show their boss that makes them all look good. Easy peasy. No, well, well, it sounds easy, easy in theory, but, but yeah, I'm with you. I, I'm with you. You know, I want to kind of hone in on one thing you said that's just so genius that so many, I mean, I, I see executive directors in the nonprofit space, and I don't think that they get as clear as the one thing you said I want to clue in on. It's we're looking for demonstrable results. It's got to be clear what we're aiming for. I think I sometimes I see nonprofits, they're, they're, 
just spinning their wheels, creating a process, yeah. but they're not really aiming at a result. Yeah. And I love the way that you delineated. Mm -hmm. You're like, we're going for a specific result. So smart stuff. Yeah, a hundred percent. We couldn't do, we could, we can't make the case to change someone's mind, a business leader's mind, if we don't have data that goes with it, right? Yes. When as a, as a community, so I'll speak specifically to disability, what we've done is very insulated and it's very protectionist and it's very low expectation. And that is because, and we're, we're parents, so we know how this is. Most disabled voices or disability voices for the past 50 years have really been parents and caregivers of young people who have disabilities. And what that has turned into is an infantilization of adults with disabilities that we continually think about as children. And that has been very, very good in a lot of ways from a philanthropic perspective. Okay. But when it comes to getting people to work, we continuously fail because we continually are talking about our, our product, our commodity, which is, is our talent, as if they're children, as if they are incapable. We set incredibly low expectations for what they should want out of their life instead of saying, we're going to be adults. We're going to work to the, our highest ability. That may not be Julie's ability. It may not be Joe's ability, but it's your ability. Yes. And starting to make those pushes so that we're changing the expectation of our community, but that we're also hearing from people with disabilities, not just their caregivers. And I think that when you when you see sort of that from, from my inside out perspective, that's where we failed each other. And that's really, you know, when we talk about you know, what do we want to show? We want to show that people bring talent value every single day into these organizations. They're already working for you. And it's not just a donation to the Special Olympics, which is a fantastic thing to do, but it's how do you grow the talent that is already existing with your organization with disabilities? How do you get them to stay? And when it comes to attracting new people with disabilities, how do you get someone like me to pick your company instead of picking your competitor? And it's because you've got a what's in it for me okay. that's targeted in the messaging for me. And so I, I know I kind of went off kilter there, I follow. but it is really, really about um, creating demonstrable outcomes so that we can show the community and that we can show the business community what we're actually capable of. So articulate. I can see why you're so good at this. Uh, that was very articulate. And there's a detail that uh, you mentioned in there this, at the sales part, you mentioned husband. When we started the story, you were a single mom and they were challenged. Where, where did uh, said yeah. husband come along in the, in the story here? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I was going to say it, it earlier. Um, yeah, I think that's the other piece that really, you know, one is I wouldn't have been in a place for him when we met if I had not gone on the journey. Yes. But I was not completely stable yet. It, I was still very early in the journey. Yes. And I was lucky enough to meet someone who was looking for a partner um, and could understand in a way that I hadn't met anyone before um, that just because this is the way my brain functioned didn't mean that I didn't have value in a relationship. And he put up with a lot of ups and downs. Um, and, and we blended a family together, um, three kids. And without him, again, I wouldn't be sitting here doing the things that I, I get to do because I wouldn't have been able to take the risks um, that I took. And I wouldn't have been able to you know, work at a lower rate as we built the business and all those things if I didn't have a good partner. Um, and, and that is, you know, Kind of, I would say it's the, the little bit of the feather in the cap of my story is that I got stable and I, I got a great business, but I've got a partner and a best friend and and a, and a business partner too that I I wouldn't have um, if I hadn't started down that journey, and that's really what's made this life great. Um, you know, besides all the other things, is you know we get to travel the world together. We live in Portugal part time. Um, you know we are now empty nesters. So there's all of this really amazing new things that have opened up that 21 year old Julie would never have even seen uh, as, as feasible. 
What a beautiful story. It, it, it parallels my own story in so many ways that a uh, partner, supportive, loving partner, allowed you to be yourself. I'm totally different now mm-hmm. after met my Julie and my emotional intelligence is much, much higher. My empathy is much higher. I can hear people now. I mean, she's, she's been a game changer for me. So thank you for sharing the story. Uh, and we're so happy to hear not how it ends, but how it's continuing. Cause your story from where you were, who you are as your path continues to evolve, it's helping people and you're overcoming your own stuff. And I'm just, you're a testament. You're a model for you know, hope that others can do it too. And by the way, this is shocking. For those of you who are watching on the YouTube channel, Julie just said she's an empty nester. I, I want to question that because she's like <laughs> definitely younger than me. Uh, and I've still got probably 15 more years before the kids are out. Uh, oh, well, we'll just thank the gods for good Botox. Thank, thank the gods. Say. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, Julie, where can we find you on social media, your websites, your social media handles? We'd love to you know connect more and follow you. How yeah. would we do that? Would love that. Um, so you can find me on any of the socials just under Julie Sowash, S-O-W-A-S-H. Um, you can visit our website at disabilitytalent.org. Um, and yeah, that's it. And you can follow us on any of our socials as well. We would welcome any new uh, engagement. Fantastic. Well, this is, it's, it's been really, I, w- I want to say it's been easy to be with you. It's been an emotional ride. I mean, I I, I feel our listeners, we, we started super transparent and vulnerable and real. And I think we all fell in love with you at that time. Just your, your ability just to be authentic. That's, that's what we're looking for. So thank you for that. Okay. And then, yeah, just the story continues to evolve and help others. This has been a great story. We'd love to ask you a couple lightning round questions before we wrap up, Julie. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. If, I did not sign on for this, but let's go. If you're a reader, then what might be one to three books that have had an impact? That you might recommend um so the history of whiteness is one of my favorite books of all time okay. um it is about just growing up in a very white middle west or middle midwest excuse me um mindset and how to see outside of just being a white person okay um junkie reading i read Anything by Jonathan Mayberry. He's like my escape artist uh, okay. um, when I need to, to get out of things. Um, and then I would also say anything by Eddie Glau Jr. or um, Simon Sinek, right? Like I'll go old school and say, um, start with why. A lot of my business model is built around start with why. Um, and the way I started talking about my business changed when I read that book too, yes. because I realized I had to make loyalty. Um, so there you go. Wide range. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Very wide range. I, I've not heard of Jonathan Mayberry. Uh, so I'm going to go check that out. Thank you. I've not heard the history of whiteness either. So I'm going to check that out. Uh, this is that. Ah. It's it's an easy read too. It's it's short and really eye-opening. When you say that, the first thing that comes to mind is I read that book by Tara Westover, uh, Educated. Uh, and she grew up in, uh, I want to say it's Idaho, a very secluded spot with a very focused on just one type of thinking. Uh, Fascinating. So uh, thank you. Uh, Let's go to the next one, music. So if you're a music person, what might be a song or an artist or a genre that just fills your bucket? So I'm a very basic white girl. I love Dave Matthews Band. I've seen him (laughs) um, more than 50 times, probably less than 70 times. Um, My favorite song is number 41. If you know, you know. in a couple of weeks, I get to go see Taylor Swift at Wembley with my uh, oldest daughter. So I'm really excited about that. Nice. Um, and her, I haven't cursed yet. So here I'm going to my favorite song by Taylor Swift right now is called Revenge Shit. Awesome. Oh, nice um, bleep. You just got bleeped. <laughs> awesome. And and of course, the Foo Fighters are, are round out the top three. Wow. Awesome. Okay. Down to the last question. Okay. Uh, and you have the last word, Julie. The question is, this this is the Eternal Optimist podcast. What might Eternal Optimist mean to you? So I think that it means, and this is going to sound weird, I think, but I think that it means to me that we have a lifetime's worth of work to do. 
And so I think it's sort of in our, in my world around diversity and equity and underrepresented communities and, and changing things is that we sort of get in this mindset that it has to happen. And if it doesn't happen right now, then we failed and, and the world has failed and the system has failed and it's really exhausting. Um, and what I tell everyone is we've got a lifetime's worth of work to do and it's all good work. And it's work that changes people's lives. It's work that keeps people alive, who gives them the opportunity to have a family, a home, a career, a car, whatever it is that they need for them to have that. And we have to give ourselves grace because we can't expect perfection from ourselves and we can't expect perfection from the world around us when it it's not yet built to what we need to do. And so some people might say, well, that sounds like a lifetime of not optimism. But for me, it is optimism because we're going in the right direction. We're making the right moves because it is actually happening. I can see it. I can demonstrate it. And that is what gives me the energy to keep going. And you can see my husband in the back now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Julie. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.